Just now I was referring to the right efforts and it's an aspect of Buddha Dhamma which is perhaps somewhat neglected. And it is so important the fact that the Buddha was once asked to, to characterize his teaching there are so many different religious movements, cults, sects, and so on, at the time of the Buddha. And he replied, this is a Viryavada teaching. So you're probably familiar with the Vada, as in Theravada, but the Buddha said this is Viryavada. So it's a teaching which is characterized by its emphasis on the efficacy of effort. Effort has meaning. And this is tied up with the fundamental principles of Dhamma expressed in the Buddha's saying that we become sublime as human beings through effort, through training, through education. We fully express our humanity most completely when we are learning. We are learners or we are learning how to learn. And the Arahant described by the Lord Buddha as the Aseka Pugala, the graduate. He's the only one, doesn't need to learn anything. So this is our conventional identity. And we, our identity as Buddhists is we are learners. And Lumpu Man, who's the teacher of uh, Lumpo Cha, many other great masters emphasized this point on many occasions. He would say, every blade of grass is teaching you. So the question is, how can we hear that? How can we learn? How can we open ourselves up to the Dhamma? In the practice of meditation, Many people will make a goal of peace, inner peace, 
but we don't, as we begin, we don't really know what that means. You know, what is inner peace? We only have the most vague idea and the most usual mistake is to assume that peace is somehow related to relaxation. So it's very common uh, for novice meditators, people on the beginning of the path, to struggle with agitation of mind. And as the agitation starts to recede, relaxation starts to spread through the body and mind, then heedlessness arises. Heedlessness means um, we let go of our mindfulness and we relax. We've done it. This, we've realized peace, but it, what we have in fact realized is a very superficial level of relaxation. And if you let go of mindfulness, you let go of your refuge and you'll get dull and sleepy. And this is such a common occurrence, this pendulum switch between agitation and dullness. So one of the ways of, of getting out of that rut you know, is to reframe the whole idea and scope and purpose of meditation, making this a learning experience. And just now I spoke of the feedback that we get. So if the mind is agitated or there are sensual thoughts or angry um, <clears throat> resentful thoughts in the mind, this doesn't mean that you're a, a lousy meditator. It means this you're learning something about your mind. And when your mind wants to jump out of the present moment, and wants to distract itself, this are, these are its chosen um, areas. So some some People's minds will tend to incline to the sensual world. Some people incline to um, occasions when people have hurt us and, and offended us and treated us with contempt and bring them up and dwell on them. And so there are, there are various ways in which the mind runs away from the reality of the present moment. And to prevent that and to deal with that, we have to expose it, we have to illuminate it. And the begin and meditation, uh, certainly to begin with, is this process of using the mindfulness of an object to illuminate the habitual workings of the mind. So we don't know what peace is as yet, but we all know what is not peace. The, uh, the analogy I like is of Michelangelo's horse and somebody says, how could you possibly create a horse which seems full of life and vigor from a lump of rock and Michelangelo apparently says, I didn't, I just chipped away all the bits of this rock which were not the horse. And, and with the practice of meditation, then we can look at it, we're learning how to let go of all the things which are not peaceful, and then we see what's left. We don't have to have an idea about it beforehand. It is um, extremely important in any endeavor, as I'm sure you know, um, to make sure that the first steps are in the right direction, are well taken, well directed. In meditation, the 
foundation, the beginning, is right attitude, right aspiration. What we need is interest, curiosity, enthusiasm, commitment, determination. All of these mental qualities are not going to be there every time you sit down and cross your legs. Sometimes they will be, but not always. But without those qualities, you'll waste a lot of time, often get very frustrated. And part of the skill of meditation and by implication, the skill of life skill is to be constantly adjusting one's motivation and cultivating this quality of wise desire or chanda. So one of the misconceptions of Buddha Dhamma, uh, which is I think starting to um, dissipate a little these days, is that Buddhism teaches you shouldn't have any desires. And desire is a bad thing. And, then, and, and that leads to people um, refuting the Buddha's teaching. It's a straw man refutation. Well, if you don't have any desires, how could you possibly live in the world or the real world? How could you function? Um, and of course, the, the Buddha is not, in fact, teaching this at all. The Buddha says, wherever there is ignorance of the way things are, craving will arise. Craving is the expression of ignorance. The craving for sensual experience, the craving to become, to be, to be loved, to be respected, to be known, to be famous. The, the, the craving to get rid of, to be free, I don't need this right now, go away. This, so these are three kind of clusters of craving. We call kama tanha, bhava tanha, vipava tanha. These are the expressions of ignorance. In the, so in, sorry if I'm, I don't want too much Pali language, avicca is the word for ignorance and vicca is the word for knowledge. Wherever there is knowledge and clear seeing, there is not an absence of motivation, there is not an absence of desire, but there is a different kind of desire. There is a wise desire, a constructive desire, which is an essential element of the path to liberation. Without it, there can be no liberation. So the, the uh, Buddhist teaching is not one of the elimination of all desire, it's the elimination of ignorant desire and the cultivation of wise desire. Example, everyday example, if you are pursuing some, some task, some uh, involved in some activity, if your mind is overly focused on the result of the activity, the goal, the reward, then the mind is um, under the power of craving. How do you know that? Um, one of the um, immediately um, obvious phenomena that arises with craving is restlessness. Craving is always accompanied by a certain level of restlessness, not necessarily like a, an agitation. Sometimes it can be a very subtle agitation, mental agitation, mental restlessness. Wise desire is primarily focused on the process itself. There is an occasional 
reference to the goal. But the main interest is on the process, on the causes and conditions leading to the goal and to the perfection of the cultivation of those causes and conditions. When the mind is focused on the process, on the causes and conditions and learning how to tweak, fine tune those, the mind is not agitated, it's uplifted, it's energized. So, and another key feature of, of Buddha Dhamma is that we're not given dogmas that we have to believe in, we're given observations, working hypotheses, and we are challenged to put them to the test of our experience. The Buddha didn't want us just to believe in things because he said them. And the Buddha said that just although he appreciates um, the offerings, material offerings, what truly pleases the Buddha is the offerings of Dhamma. And, and we offer the Dhamma, the practice of Dhamma, by taking the teachings and trying to put them into effect in our life. We, ex we become Buddhists not through faith, but through the effort to test the things we believe in as working hypothesis. So faith is always dynamic in Buddhists. So in many, most belief systems, Faith is a cul-de-sac. You are given a series of propositions or dogmas which you have, you cannot, you humanly, you are incapable of proving whether they are true or not. You have a choice, believe or not believe, and that's it. And that will never go beyond that. What you will experience is a waxing or waning of your confidence and, and, and faith in those dogmas, but you will never be able to say, I prove that um, to be true or untrue. Whereas the Lord Buddha's teachings are statements about the real world, statements about our human life, our human experience our human potential. So if there are basic objects of faith, I can abandon the unwholesome. I can cultivate the wholesome. I can purify my mind. I have the potential for liberation. So these are the objects of faith, if we, if we we want to speak in those terms. But you can see these are not cul-de-sacs, quite the opposite. That we can only claim to have faith in Buddha Dhamma when we are putting forth the effort to see, can I in fact abandon unwholesome Dhammas? Can I in fact cultivate the wholesome? Can I in fact purify my mind. So this relationship between faith, satha, and effort is a key one to understand. Many, many years ago, um, I, from an early age, I had a, um, I don't know, maybe unhealthy interest in sensory deprivation. And um, I was very fortunate at um, a certain uh, stage in my monastic career to do a long retreat in a pitch black cave. Um, so it was total sensory deprivation. I couldn't even see my hand in front of my face. And I just, you know, you, I think everyone assumes that there's this kind of steady, hopefully if you're sincere enough and you try hard enough, there's this kind of steady stairway to heaven and beyond heaven uh, in practice. But in fact, it's more like snakes and ladders wherever you are and even with the most conducive conditions. So I went through a period, I was a year in this cave, and I went through a period 
where it's just like uh, enemies, just just kind of lack of enthusiasm, and and of course you don't. Have, this is one of the drawbacks of being alone and in a, in a cave. You don't have anyone to give you some inspiration and inspire you, and you have to do it yourself. And you have, and it, and it forces you to really um, consider this whole matter of motivation and how to motivate yourself. And so I felt this, this lack of effort, lack of energy. And I reflected on this teaching of five spiritual powers and of faith or sattā leading to effort, effort leading to mindfulness, mindfulness to samādhi and samādhi to wisdom. So I thought the causes and conditions for effort are not there. Um, it's a faith problem. And of course, I look, it's a dialogue with me. I mean, I want, no, I mean, you, you, you have a really strong faith in Buddha, Dhamma, Sangha. You wouldn't be here. You wouldn't be living your life like this if you didn't. That's ridiculous. No, but not talking about like a general kind of faith as an attitude to life or a, a framework for, for how I'm living my life, but as a mental factor as a mental state in the present moment. So I lit a candle. So I did, a, I had a small supply of candles. I had to be very, very careful about using them. And I lit a candle and I had a little Buddha and I bowed to the Buddha and I bowed to the Dhamma and I bowed to the Sangha and then I bowed to Venerable Sariputta three times, and Venerable Mahamogalana three times, and Venerable Anuruddha three times, Venerable Ananda. And I went through all of the great monks in the time of the Buddha that I could remember. And then all of the great monks through history, and all of the great uh, monks in Thailand and Burma, and, and, and bowing again and again, like hundreds of times. And all this joy and, and faith and energy arose in my mind. I thought, oh, that's it. Hmm. Don't think about faith as just an overall um, framework or a way of looking at, at um, practice and taking for granted that you have that. It's just like it's something in your, uh, in your mind. It's a, it's a quality that you possess, but it's something that arises and passes away, waxes and wanes, and that the proof that it's waning or uh, not uh, a refuge right now is the lack of effort. So when you're feeling lazy, this you know, for myself, this I'm lazy. It's okay. You don't have to say I'm a bad person because I'm lazy. Um, you say, what's what is this? You know, what's going on here? What are the causes and conditions? And this is the essential Buddhist approach. We're always looking at causes and conditions. And whether that's, and that's in every area of life. It's like, um, I was talking about this yesterday. Um, people say, oh, I'm such a bad person. You know, I just have all this kind of self-aversion and self-loathing. And, um, and I said, why? And I said, well, I did this really bad thing or I've done these really bad things. And I, and I said, it's like, what's the connection? I don't see the connection here. You know, for me, it's like, um, you know, a room like this and you have all the doors open um, and a, a, like a serial killer comes into the room. You say, what a bad room. I think this is a bad room. <laughs> Why? Well, the serial killer came in here and, and a raging narcissist and, and all these horrible people. Come. Well, yeah, if you leave the doors open, anybody can walk in. You know, if the door of that size and that shape and a human being of those dimensions, why not? You know, it's causes and conditions. Um, and it's with life, it's simple like this. And you, if you look back and, and not looking at me and my life and my personal history and my personality and uh, my trauma, what actually happened? Let's look at it like in a, 
um, at that very moment where you did a stupid thing or said a stupid thing, what actually was happening? Well, um, in the mind at that moment, there was like this much greed, this much anger, this much conceit, this much pride, uh, this much heedlessness, and so on. And then you say, like, this much mindfulness, this much patience, you know, <laughs> this, this much loving kindness. What do you expect? <laughs> I mean, come on, you know, this is, I say, this is not rocket science. I, I, I just thought about this yesterday. I say, like, what, what do people in NASA say? You know, when they want to say this is not, <laughs> you know, and I, because, you know, they say it's not rocket science. Well, it is. You know, <laughs> so, so my idea is they probably say, uh, look, Robert, this is not Paticca Sabumpada. <laughs> and it's, it's like, yeah, it's just rocket science. And, and so this is this is it's not so complex it's not so difficult you know that at the end of the day the, you have this wholesome and unwholesome dhammas you have mindfulness and heedfulness you have anger and loving kindness you know you have patience and impatience in varying levels and if the if you've cultivated impatience um and you haven't cultivated patience, when it comes to the nitty-gritty, when, when you're on the spot, then the one which you've cultivated and which is stronger will come out on top. It's not a comment about who you are. It's not like you're a good person or a bad person or any kind of person at all. It's just that simple. And so looking at it in this way, um, then you can see, yeah, and that was a really stupid thing to do. Um, and if I don't work hard and make this effort uh, to reduce the amount of patience, impatience in my mind and to cultivate patience, if I don't cultivate mindfulness, if I don't cultivate uh, metta and loving kindness, I can't guarantee this might happen again. Who knows? If the causes and conditions conspire, it could happen again. But if I develop these qualities, I can be confident that they won't happen again, whatever the trigger. Because we, we are not simply the prey of conditions. We don't have to be. We have this potential uh, to ab abandon the unwholesome, develop the wholesome, cultivate the mind. We have a capacity to develop mindfulness. And that's something that's not a dogma, is it? You know, you can see if you put effort uh, into developing mindfulness, you become a bit more mindful. Um, the, we, can, we can put this to the test. And the Buddha's teachings are like this. There are so many of the teachings that we can uh, we can look at and examine and verify at quite an early stage in practice. And what happens when we do that is we have this thing. Yes, the Buddha. That's like, that's so true. Yeah. And have you noticed how, what a great feeling that is? You know, very. I think overlooked source of joy in life and happiness in life. You say, when you find something that's true, you say, yeah, that's so true. Oh, the Buddha just, that's so exactly right. Oh, yes. The way. And, <clears throat> and it's this accumulation, steady, uninterrupted accumulation of yes moments based upon the sincere effort to verify the Buddha's teachings that strengthen our faith as Buddhists. This is, this is not um, a faith in philosophical concepts, in, in dogmas, but we develop a trust in the Buddha 
because every time we've put a teaching to the test, he's come up trumps. He's always right, you know, and there's such a confidence and, and, um, and trust in the Buddha that arises. You know, you never, you so then, and you try something out and you say, well, the Buddha got that one wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah. That's a disappointment. <laughs> you know, they, I, I never had that experience in my like 50 years of doing this. You know? and, and this gives you a basis for, for relating to teachings which are beyond your capacity to verify at the moment, or things like heaven realms and hell realms and Buddhist cosmology and all these things. And you say, you know, well, um, this is part of the Buddha Dhamma and it's the and the teachings which the Buddha has given us, what I have been able to verify, have all been true. And so I'm, I'm going to trust the Buddha, take these things as working hypothesis. And in the teaching on the Eightfold Path, where the Buddha distinguishes between, we say, mundane right view and super mundane right view, which is another word for like liberating wisdom, uh, mundane right view, which is the foundation for the whole of the Eightfold Path, means that through this reasoned, reasonable trust in the Buddha's wisdom, we take on these concepts and these ideas of rebirth um, as working hypothesis, because doing so helps us to to develop in the Dhamma. They are great aids and supports. And refuting them or there's there isn't an agnostic position. I mean it, it, it this sounds like there is, but there isn't really. I, I don't really know about um heaven and hell round. But and that sounds reasonable, but um when you have to make a choice then whether, whether, or, whether or not heaven and hell realms exist or not can be a factor in, in making a choice. And the agnostic usually uh, self um, call, uh, ag agnostic will usually take the role that they don't exist. And, and again, one question is, when people say, Oh, I, you know, I love the Buddhist teachings, mindfulness and that metta, that's really good, I like that one, and, and, you know, so much, it's really good. But all that stuff about heaven, yeah, that's a bit too, I, I can't, no, I can't take that. Um, and, and then if you say, why not? I said, I, I just can't, you know, I just try to imagine it in my mind, I just can't. And, and my response to it, oh, so, this is your position, that your ability to visualize something in your mind is a proof of whether it exists or not. You're saying it doesn't exist because I can't make a picture of it in my mind. Is that correct? Um, well, that seems to me putting a lot of faith, you know, in the ability of human imagination to understand the universe. I prefer to put my faith in the Buddha. Simple, um, straightforward. Yeah, I'm a simple man. I've just put my faith in the Buddha because he's never let me, and my imagination has let me down a lot. <laughs> I, I feel this is quite a reasonable position. <laughs> anyway, so I'm saying it, it it's really worthwhile taking these things on, but with this humble acceptance, and the Buddha had a wonderful word for this, he called caring for the truth, Satchanuraka. And that means that you don't claim that what you believe must be true because you believe it. And this is the cause of so much religious conflict in the world today, isn't it? Because I believe it, it's, it's why? why, why? Because it's true. <laughs> yeah, but how do you know it's true? Well, because the moment I, I, I just knew, I just, I just believe. So I, you know, I believe because it's true, and it's true because I believe it, basically. 
That's, that's the circular reasoning. But the intensity of belief is not a proof that what you believe is necessarily true, is it? I don't think that that's, that point can be refuted by anybody, no matter what religion or, or an atheist. You have to accept that it's possible, it's humanly possible to believe 100% in something that's not true. There, I used to, I, this is a confession, I had a 100% unshakable belief in Santa Claus. <laughs> and I found out it was untrue and it, my life was shattered. <laughs> but, but, but it's humanly possible. And so when we have a strong faith in something, this is our recollection, this is our mindfulness. Yeah, I really feel this strong trust and faith and confidence, and it's founded in reasonable assumptions, and I've considered this, but at the end of the day, it's not knowing, it's belief. And belief is a supportive factor on the path. Right belief, sattā and faith can lead to wiriya and right effort. And right effort, the four right efforts, lead to mindfulness. And mindfulness and samadhi, what's, what's the, the, the relationship between them? Again, I think it's very simple. Samadhi is the name that we give for an uninterrupted stream of mindfulness. Ajahn Chah had a very nice um, simile for this. He said it's like when you start practicing, like you turn on a tap or faucet and drop, drip, drip. So the drip is the mindfulness and the gap between the drip is the distraction. And as you practice a bit more, it's hopefully it's drip, 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 and then finally you have a stream of water. And that stream of water and stream of mindfulness is samadhi. So when you have a stream, uninterrupted stream of mindfulness, certain changes take place in the body and mind. There's a very intense feeling of well-being and relaxation. There's a sense of solidity and firmness and calmness uh, and joy, all of these different factors, mental factors arising when we call in what we call samadhi. So mindfulness, uninterrupted mindfulness is samadhi. And what's the relationship between samadhi and panya? Well samadhi temporarily arrests or may could say anesthetizes the deep instinct we have to react to phenomena either by moving towards or moving away. So in daily life, that coarser expression is, I like this, I want it, give it to me, or I don't like this, go away. Um, but in, as we look more closely into the mind, we see it's just, it really can be really uh, subtle. But as long as there is that movement towards or away from the experience in the present moment, then there can be no insight into the nature of things, the true nature of things. So the, the, um, the value, the purpose of, of samadhi, is it has great value intrinsically in itself, but Ultimately, and most importantly, its value is we call yata putayana dasana, means seeing things according, seeing things in their true light, we can say. But this is the value of samadhi. So usually we don't see things in their true light because of bias and prejudice and instinctive movement towards a movement. This is why we need to develop sati to the level of samadhi and to provide that firm foundation for wisdom or panya. So as we develop samadhi, we, we, we can 
let, let, just, let me just retrace a little bit and say one of the reasons I think that people often become discouraged with practice of meditation is that they have too high expectations. You, know, you want jhanas and yanas and all this, this stuff, you know, and, and it's not happening. You know, and then maybe you look at other people and they're sitting, you know, like sitting, they're all like sitting like this. And you, oh, wow. Um, when am I ever going to be able to sit like that? And, and um, so imagine that they're actually, they're just thinking about what they're going to have for dinner. <laughs> but, but anyway, not everyone, of course. But what I, what I, what I would suggest is that you're much more precise in your observations of the results of meditation practice on the quality of your life. This will be easiest if you make your main meditation practice early in the morning. And then make a point of observ observing um, what happens. And so you will see just the incremental in, um, increases in the quality of your life. Just a little bit more mindfulness, a little bit more patience, a little bit more kindness, a little bit more generosity. You know, don't, if you're looking way up there, you know, you can't see what's right in front of you. And maybe you will have some of these really life-changing experiences. Um, hope you do. But that, they're not the proof of the pudding. The proof of the pudding is day by day, you, you, you're realizing that there is this gradual um, letting go of the unwholesome, gradual development of the wholesome, purification of the mind begin to notice certain things that you, you suddenly think, oh, a year ago, if somebody had said that to me or been so nasty, you know, I would have been shaken, I would have been devastated the whole day. You know. And now I feel, yeah, it's not I don't feel anything, but it's really not like it used to be. Um, and so you become, your sense of more resilient and more unshakable, in, in the face of unpleasant situations. Yeah, can you see that? And um, then you become more appreciative of goodness. Have you noticed that as you meditate? Things that would, you probably wouldn't even notice. And then you see some small act of kindness and you find tear in your eye. That's so beautiful. That's so lovely. You know, and it's, these are not like kind of big, dramatic gestures. Every day, normal kindnesses that people are performing all the time. You just open your eyes. It's, this is not kind of Pollyanna practice, you know. It's not like positive thinking. It's opening your eyes. And there's so much, so many small acts of goodness and kindness. I often say, if you're... Um, I, I, I'm a kind of lazy person and um, the uh, living in a big monastery it's very difficult to be lazy so I, now I live by myself it's a lot more convenient and, but if you are a lazy person like me and you still have some aspiration to liberation the number one practice is mudita again you know we'll talk about metta and karuna but, you know just seeing like the good actions of other people, it's just, I don't want to know, you know. And it's this constant stream of uplifting emotion. You don't have to do anything. You can just sit there in your chair. And, <laughs> I mean, what, what could be cooler, you know? It's just great, you know. And, and the more you practice, the better your eye becomes, the more sensitive you becomes. And even small acts of kindness can bring, like, seems like disproportionate kinds of joy to the mind. So there is a kind of, I, I see a kind of a twin um, evolution. You become more and more unmoved by unpleasant impacts and more and more moved by goodness. 
And if you see that, then yeah, you're on the right path. You just keep, and, and hiri otapa, and you know, like one of the, you know, people, what does it mean to be smart? What, what, are, what are our criteria for being smart? And the Buddha answers this question on a number of occasions. He says, what's, what's, a, what's a definition of a sage or of a wise person? smart person and he never talks about cognitive faculties it's always behavioral qualities he says someone who does not harm him or her self or others that is the the hallmark of a wise person so however well educated you have, you have a degree from here and there in Ivy League or um, Poison Ivy League, wherever you've been, you know, you, if you're still harming yourself or harming others, you don't get it because you don't get the most important thing you need to understand in your life is causality. What are the causes of flourishing in your life and what are the causes of decline and suffering both in this life and future life and if you don't understand the law of kamma um, then you know you don't understand anything basically anything that you really need to know you know you know a lot of stuff you can even write books but you don't know the most important thing and knowing how important it is to keep the five precepts is the most um, important, you know, vital thing for your well-being. I used to, I used to speak with the villagers a lot, you know, when I was the abbot of the monastery and sort of hang out in the kitchen on, and just chat with the old people and we used to have some great conversations, a little bit of teasing and and I was saying, you're so, you're so fortunate, you know, because you have a superstitious belief in true things. Um, <laughs> I said, you know, there are, there are all these really smart people in the West, you know, who have really intelligent um, confidence in untrue things, you know. Um, but I said, you know, you you are smarter than, I'm not just, I'm not just um, sort of buttering you up or flattering you, but you are smarter than 90% of the people in this world at least because you keep the five precepts. You understand um, what leads to progress, what leads to regress, what leads to happiness, what leads to suffering in life. Um, and what could be more important than that? So we, we, this, this practice is such a, a wonderful... I have, I have this um, slogan. I'm going to tell you my, my slogans of the year. This is a, I have two slogans of the year at the moment. It's early days, isn't it? It's only April, so we'll see. <laughs> but first slogan of the year is, you are all unique by QR codes. That's number one. Yeah, um, think about it. Then the second one is enjoy your Buddhist life. You know, I think in Thailand there is a real sense that being sincere is not the same thing as being like serious, you know, or, you know, overly serious, I guess you say. Like having that lightness and enjoyment and, you know, enjoy your meditation practice. You, monks, we have to enjoy being monks, you know, that's the one guarantee that, you know, you'll spend the rest of your life as a monk because you really enjoy it, you know, and you have to enjoy meditation. If you're really going to progress in Dhamma, in Max, you have to find a way of enjoying your practice, enjoying the abandoning of uh, unwholesome, enjoy the development of the wholesome, enjoy the purification of the mind. It is enjoyable. It's, it, that's not an unreachable, unattainable ideal. Just make it a, a, a practice. And, and each meditation, each breath, enjoy your breath. I'm not saying enjoy it as like the way you did, like enjoy a, um, you know, a good meal, but 
enjoy, appreciate the way you would enjoy a subtle masterpiece in a museum. Enjoy your breath like you'd enjoy a Japanese garden. Yeah, just enjoy that. And notice whenever your mind is content in the present moment, whenever the mind, is, how does that feel? Feels great. Peace, where's peace? You know, so we're talking about that just now, you know, okay. And we can all right now experience peace. Are you, are you interested? I think probably yes. Okay, I'm, that's a kind of rhetorical question. So breathe out and just observe that little gap, that little pause between out breath and in breath. That's peace. Nothing very kind of mystical, special, and it's, you can all, and just observe that again and again, that little pause, and learn how to expand it. And you can expand that pause so it becomes more and more prominent, and then you can, and the kind of awareness of that pause can actually be present when there's thinking. So before you start less and less thinking, more and more pause, and then you can experience the, the same kind of awareness of pause within the thinking. So that's really interesting. I'm going to end my discourse here because I'm going on a bit, and uh, forgive me for this, I so don't come very often. So um, I have a, a tip. Uh, everyone likes meditation tips, and I'm not a great fan of them, but this tip is... <laughs> This tip is one that I think is really cool. I want to share with you all. So if your mind is really agitated and it's rushing here and rushing there, and it's the, don't fight against it. Don't push back. Don't resist the agitated mind. Give your agitated mind permission. You can think whatever you want. Go ahead. Okay? But one condition, you have to think in slow motion. Okay? Carry on thinking about whatever you want to think. So you're not fighting it, but it's like a wild horse and you're just going with it and slowing it down and taming it. And, and so you, you reduce that kind of frustration and, and, com and conflict and sort of self-awareness. Um, and what you're doing when you slow down the thinking is you take away that kind of sense of, but I still want to think about that, leave me alone. And you're allowing it, but you're in, it, what, you are, what you're doing, you're introducing pauses between each word. And by doing that, now you become more and more aware of the pauses, like I was explaining just now. And then the words start to fade away. If you're more of a visual thinker, then it's a very nice, I, 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 wonderful Tibetan technique where you just imagine, you can do this with words as well, but imagine the images on the surface of a pond of water. Again, why, why this is so good is you don't have to do anything. It happens by itself. You just experience the images just dissipating in the water. So the thing with, with this like thinking and this kinds of defilement is you don't want to go head to head. You know, you have to be more subtle. So, you, so it's more like sort of, I'm not a martial artist, but at this, I'm just guessing. You know, it's like you take that energy and you go with it and you slow it down until it passes away. So there's so many, there are so many things and, and ways of working with the mind. You don't have to um, follow just what's in the books. Um, once you, the, the Buddhist principle is Dhammanu Dhammapatipata, which means practicing Dhamma in accordance with Dhamma. So the, in that sentence, the second Dhamma means the, the basic 
fundamental principles of Dhamma. And the first Dhamma means like the techniques, the applications, um, and it means that you can be creative, you can try stuff out as long as you are um, within the boundaries, as long as you're practicing in harmony with the major principles. You have to keep returning to those major principles and just checking. And then you can, you know, this, this practice of slow motion thinking, that's not in the Visuddhimagga, it's not in the suttas, but it's not in conflict with them. And I think, um, from my experience, I mean, it's, it's a good enough technique that I've come all the way from Thailand to share it with you. <laughs> so I'd like to end my discourse at this moment, at this point. Hắn thầm yang thầm ngã thá sa thú cà răng thả đà mà xê Sa thú, sa thú, sa thú, anu mô tha mi